well, well, well. I think everyone is uh, seeing us. <clears throat> OK. Dr. Nalmo, how are you? I think Hi, good. good afternoon. Seeing us. I will mute. Yes. Okay, I think we can start. If we have already uh, 25 per person present, look, uh, I think it's uh, the time. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. So my name is uh, Philippe Landreau. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm the chief medical officer of uh, DX Bone. Uh, uh, Bone and Joint and uh, Excellence Center. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone, the, the people who are here in the front of their screen for attending our first live broadcast from uh, the Xbone Forum. We call that the Xbone Forum because we want something interactive and uh, discussion with uh, all the people. Uh, it's done, the, the main objective is to uh, develop our, uh, our educational platform and to take opportunity of this, uh, if I can say, of this uh, uh, special situation and difficult situation to continue the education through the, the webinar. And uh, it's uh, dedicated to uh, the majority of, um, of uh, our colleagues who are surgeons, any doctors, physiotherapists, uh, and in general, all healthcare providers interested in this field. So don't forget that this, this will be available uh, to revisit at any time on uh, our DxBone channel. So please uh, subscribe and you will be informed uh, every week because we will do that every week during the COVID period of confinement. And uh, if you want to be informed, you, you just have to subscribe on our DxBone channel, but we will inform you through email and the WhatsApp as we did for the first time. So for our first live forum, I'm very happy to start with my colleague, uh, Bernard Lallemand. Bernard Lallemand is our uh, consultant orthopedic surgeon specialized in uh, upper limb and hand surgery. He's Belgium and he has uh, extensive experience in this field across uh, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Qatar. Aspetar. This is where we met and we work uh, together for a few years. And uh, this is how I discovered his uh, quality on the professional and human point of view. And now I'm very happy because he joined our DxBone team to drive this project to uh, excellence. So without uh, waiting more uh, to start, uh, how it will work? So the concept is uh, every week we will do a lecture. Dr. Lallemand will do this lecture live in a few uh, seconds, a few minutes. And meanwhile, you can see uh, either on the right side or down uh, on your screen, there is a chat box. And this is where you can ask your question. So this question will be collected uh, progressively by the team. And then I will moderate and I will get the, 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 the question and I will ask the question to uh, Bernard at the end of his presentation. Uh, so please try to be accurate and clear in your questions and comments because it can be comments as well in order to facilitate the discussion because even if you are not together in the same room, but uh, we will play the game as it is and we would like to make it uh, interactive. So uh, if you have any question, comment, feel free and uh, we, will, uh, we will do our best to, uh, to answer to the question. Uh, Dr. Bernard Allemand will, uh, will answer to the question after his presentation, which will be uh, around 25 minutes, uh, 30 minutes. Uh, so Dr. Bernard Allemand, you have the microphone and please lead us through your uh, presentation about uh, sport injury in the hand. Perfect, Philip. Thank you. Thank you very much for this pleasant presentation. So I will be uh, starting with sharing my screen. So everything seems to be good. Perfect. So I'm really pleased and proud to start this first lecture in the uh, uh, Diggs Bone Forum. So I decided to discuss about sport injuries of the hand because it's a topic that I work with in Aspeta during the last six years and I'm really happy uh, to, to have a good experience in this field. So, 
For this lecture, I have no conflict of interest. I have no uh, financial support uh, uh, in regard of uh, this presentation. So why I decided to discuss about this uh, sports injury in this hand and how I will present to you. I will not do something classical. I will present you something that uh, is really amazing. We will discuss about the eponymous uh, names that we can find in the hand injury. So I will discuss about the injury where the sports give their a name like the baseball, not the rugby, but the jersey, you will see the climbers, the boxers and the skiers. So all these five sports has typical name for uh, the injury of the hand. So we will start with the baseball finger. What is the baseball finger? Baseball finger was given to uh, the mallet finger. Mallet finger is something really common that we can see because it's one of the most common closed uh, tendon injury in the pop uh, sportive uh, population. We see this uh, um, injury really common in the baseball that give this name to this injury, basketball, handball, football, so all ball uh, game. And the mallet finger, as you know, is a description of the extensive tendon at its insertion of the distal phalanx, as you can see here down. So the mechanism of injury is an eccentric mechanism. So it means that when the bite is striking the fingertip while fielding or catching, there is a forced uh, flexion moment of the distal interphalangeal joint that occurs when the extensor tendon is in active extension. So the diagnosis is quite simple. You have pain, swelling, you can have some tenderness, ecchymosis when there is a fracture and the classic mallet deformity. But the pathognomonic sign is when there is a deficit of active extension of the DAP joint. So when you arrive at this level, you will uh, be able to make the diagnosis because the patient is presenting with this mallet deformity. The X-rays is mandatory. One view is necessary, a true lateral view of the finger. Because this true lateral view will show if it's a soft tissue, so uh, only tendon injuries, like here, you don't see anything. So as you don't see anything, it's a tendon injuries. Or if there is any fracture, as you can see here, and always in this kind, you have an articular uh, fracture of uh, the joint. So I told you the ball is striking the fingertip of uh, the finger and you have a forceful, it is right for the, um, uh, tendon injuries, but sometimes you have the um, um, hyperextension of uh, this joint, the DAP joint, and then the head of the second phalanx will punch the base of the distal phalanx and create this articular fracture. So those create this classification. On the right, on the left side, you will have the injury of the tendon. The most common is the closed tendon rupture, as you can see here. And sometimes you can have uh, open injuries or wedge injuries over the joint. It's really rare. On the right side is more for the ball. The first one is to describe a Salter Harris fracture. So this fracture is commonly seen to the teenage and sometimes the child. And these are the most important for the fracture is to see if there is less than 30 or more than 30% of uh, the articular surface fracture. So the treatment. The treatment in non-displaced fracture and for all closed tendon injuries is to wear a, a extension splint of the DAP joint for six to eight weeks. I prefer to keep eight weeks following by two weeks nighttime splinting and one month splinting during the sports activities. If you have a displaced fracture or a fracture greater than 30% of the articular surface, I recommend to go to surgery, otherwise you will keep some uh, problems. So there is different type of surgery. I will show you here on the left side, you have the pinning, percutaneous spinning described by Ishiguru. And on the right side, you can put when it's big fragment or more complex fragment, you can fix it with screw or with plate and screw. So this is the mallet, so called the baseball finger. The next is the jersey finger. So the jersey finger is not really uh, an eponymous pole, but it's related to the jersey. What it means, there is a close aversion of the flexor digitorum profundus, FDP, 
and its insertion in the distal phalanx just here. We call this the zone one. This is the bunel zone of the hand, and the zone one is this part of the uh, flexor digitorum profundus. So it was described the first time in 1891 by Van Sander. So it's more than 130 years old, the injuries. And why we call this a jersey finger? Because it was frequently seen in rugby, American football or judo, when it's usually, when there is an athlete that try to grab the adversary jersey, uh, while this uh, uh, player is trying to pull out uh, this uh, player. And what happened? There is an eccentric mechanism. So you have also here a passive hyperextension of the distal interphalangeal DIP joint against a maximal contractual flexion force. So it means that it's the opposite injury of the mallet finger. So it's the volar injury of the mallet finger. So this injury could happen to all the fingers, even the thumbs. But we know that it's happened more often on the ring finger for anatomical reason described by Mansk in 1978. There is two reasons. First, the insertion of the FDP is weaker than the other long finger for anatomical and vascularization. And second, the ring finger tip is more prominent when, the, um, uh, when you have a semi-flex position of the hand when you try to wrap. So you see here, it was demonstrated in the biomedical uh, consideration by Benin in 1988. You see, if you do yourself, this semi-flexion of the hand, you will see that the longer finger is not the long or middle finger, but the ring finger. So it's really important to know that it's why this ring finger is the most uh, injured. So you will see chemosis, swelling, and pain if there is any fracture. So the pathognomonic sign in this uh, uh, injury is the inability to flex actively uh, the DAP joint. So, Another sign that you can see is the loss of the cascade in the normal hand. If you look here, normally you have the index, middle, you should have the ring finger here and the little finger there. This is the normal cascade when you have a tension in the flexor tendon. And you see in this ring finger that the cascade is broken and the DAP joint is not in natural flexion, but a little bit in extension. So most of the time you can do the diagnosis by physical examination. You see the cascade, you ask the patient to flex the DIP joint, you have the answer. But in this case, like for the mallet finger, you need to do uh, an X-rays to exclude any fracture because it's really important and I will explain you why. So without any fracture, you can ask for an MRI or an ultrasound. It could be interesting to quantify the retraction of the distal uh, tendon stump and to assess the pulli. So here you can see a fracture when you have a small bone flex here retracted until the PAP joints. Here with the ultrasound, you will see here that the, uh, the tendon is retracted um, from the distal phalanx and you see all the pulleys are empty and you have the stump of the distal FDP and on the MRI is the opposite side. The distal uh, phalanx is here and you can see the FDP stump is just here. So, Lady and Parker made a classification in 1977 on three types, the three first. So when the FDP is retracted to the palm, to the PAP joint, or if there is any bony avulsion with a retraction until the A5 pulli. And in 1981, a fourth classification was described. It's quite rare. It's a bony fragment with a retraction of the FDP until the palm. And the fifth, a little bit more common, was described by our colleague from Saudi, uh, Professor Al Katam in 2001. It's a type five. It's when you have a type three associated with a fracture of the distal phalanx. So you can see here in the type one, the retraction is until the palm, so MCP joint. The type two, the retraction is until the PAP joint. The type three, the bone block is stuck on A5. The type four, you have this bone block, but you have the retraction of the tendon. And you have here on the type five, this fracture bony avulsion associated with a fracture, transverse fracture of the distal phalanx. So 
it's really important to know a little bit about the anatomy. You have here the anatomy of the FDP and here of the FDF, the superficial tendon. And what you see here is the vincula. These vincula are really important because they give the vascularization and the potential healing of the tendon. And when you have a type, uh, when it's a type one and a type uh, uh, five, you have uh, a disruption of, uh, uh, sorry, a type one only, you have a disruption of the uh, long uh, profundis vincula. And you understand when it's a type uh, two and four, it's really um, a bad injuries because all the tendon is completely devascularized. So the treatment, for me, there is no place for the conservative treatment. And uh, when we have a type one and a type five, we should go uh, as soon as possible to the surgery within seven days maximum. Type two is more uh, three weeks can wait. After that, the pulley can starting to collapse. And the type three, it's where the repair could be done because it's a fracture. You don't uh, treat a tendon uh, within the six weeks. And the type five is like the type three. So the uh, repair of the tendon could be done by two different techniques, some mini suture anchor or uh, some pull out technique. Uh, I prefer the mini suture anchor. And I will show you a fast video showing that uh, we can do this uh, surgery on what we call the, the one on surgery. It uh, means that it could be done on uh, uh, a local anesthesia without tunica. You see here the deep, the FDP was retracting until the PAP joint. So, and now we will pass this tendon through the pulley that you can see here, the A4 and the A5 pulley here. We will pass this tendon to uh, repair it until uh, the distal phalanx. So as soon as you operate this patient, more easy is to pass through this pulley because there is no retraction. More you wait, then we need to do some surgery on the pulley and it's quite complicated. After that, I use, as you can see, two different anchors here. That will allow me, I will go a little bit faster. They will allow me to reattach the tendon through a different technique of suture. And this tendon, uh, this suture will help me to reattach the tendon on the DAP, uh, on the distal phalanx. And you can see here that the uh, DAP joint uh, start to be completely um, flex in active uh, flexion during the surgery. We can control if the surgery is well done. And you can see here, the patient is completely able to flex his DAP joint. So, these are the information that you can uh, need to give to the patient for after the surgery. We we'll have a splint for six weeks. It can start for me early active motion when the repair is really strong, no strengthening before three months. Sometimes uh, you need a dynamic uh, extension split if there is any DAP contracture and the patient is allowed to go back to heavy lifting or gripping sports after four to six months following the surgery. So now we will discuss about the third uh, injury, that's the climber's finger. So the climber's finger is quite really, really difficult to manage because it's the injury of the pulley. And you heard when I discussed about the jersey finger, about the different pulley that are here. We have in each long finger, five annular pulley, A1, A2, A3, A5, and A4. And we have three cruciate ligaments, C1 and C3, uh, C2 and C3. So the most important pulley are A2 and A4 that could be injured uh, during this sports activity. And you can see that the A2 pulley to break it need um, force more than 400 Newton to break it. It's, uh, so it means that the tension during the climber is quite difficult. Why this uh, pulley are uh, breaking uh, during this sport? It's because this is a technical uh, about uh, the gripping uh, during those sports. You can see that this, uh, what we call the hook grip, will give a strong um, force going through essentially the A2 pulley. And then you will have the slow grip that give uh, around 100, 150 Newton through the A4 and A5 pulley. And this is the most terrible position. It's the cream position that they use really often because it gives a lot of power to react. And this gives 
uh, enough force to destroy the A2 and A3 and A4 poli. So you can imagine the tension they are putting in the tendon during this sports activity. And then when happen these injuries, the patient will feel directly. They will tell you, okay, it's like for the Achilles tendon, they will say, I heard a pop. There was a snap sign. Even this pop is so loudly that it can be uh, listened by the other um, uh, climbers. So, and the patient will come to you with this swelling at the beginning pain. And sometimes in extreme uh, deformity, you will have this deformity, what we called, uh, um, I forget the name, uh, what we called, uh, you know, when there is an archery, I forget the name, sorry for that. So what happened, you have here, yes, the bowstring, you have here the bowstring of the tendon, you can see here, when the pulli are ruptured, the tendon is not staying along the, uh, the bone and make a bowstring that you can see here in the archery. Here you can see it's a really bad injury because you have an A2, A3 and A4 pulli injuries. So. You need to do an X-ray to be sure that the patient doesn't present any fracture because it's maybe the reason of uh, the swelling and the pain. An ultrasound is really interesting because you can ask a dynamic uh, flexion and you can see that during this dynamic flexion, there is an elevation and a bowstring about four or five millimeter in this case of the flexor tendon. And the MRI is really important. You will see that normally, the, uh, the tendon should be close to the tendon, uh, the bone. And here you see there is a distance more than two millimeter between the flexor tendon. And here you can see, if you compare the other finger, the tendon is completely close. And here you have um, a space of a more two to three millimeter. So you need to do the X-rays to see there is no fracture, then uh, an ultrasound or an MRI. And what to do? First, you need to know the classification. Grade one is a simple sprain of the pulley A2 pulleys. Grade two, you have a partial um, a tear of the A2 pulley. Grade three, you have a complete tear of A3 or A2 pulley. And the grade four is A2 and A3 or A2, A3, A4 pulley injuries. So Shuffle, they describe this classification as a huge experience in Germany because they are doing a lot of indoor climbing. So, uh, they say for grade one, two, three conservative treatment, only grade four should be operated. So the conservative treatment is with a, a strapping or some thermoplastic ring that you can wear uh, during uh, the following days after the injuries. So sometimes when it's really rare, you need to uh, a grade four, you need to repair the, the pulley. Me, I'm using a palmaris longus here that uh, was uh, removed from the wrist and is uh, used to repair this pulley. And you can see the result after three months, you see that the skin is still a little bit uh, inflamed. We are only at uh, three months of the injury with quite full extension and full flexion of the PAP and the AP joint. So now the boxer injury. So boxer have two eponymous name, the boxer knuckle and the boxer fracture and they can have a lot of injuries in the hand and wrist, and we can discuss this another time. So the boxer knuckle is relative to the sagittal band injuries, and it's happened when there is a severe blunt with a forceful flexion of the MCP joint, uh, resulting by a stretching of the extensor tendon, leading to a sagittal uh, band rupture. And then you can have uh, dislocation of the extensor tendon above the MCP joint. And it's quite common to the pugilist, as you can see. So this is the extensor tendon. And this extensor tendon to stay during the flexion of your hand on the top of this metacarpophalangeal joint, you need to have both sagittal band. They should be completely competent. It's like the hood for a board. And when you have a rupture, like for here, a rupture of the radial side of uh, the sagittal band, you understand that you will have a dislocation that can give a pseudo looking uh, MCP joint and sometimes give also pain. So the classification for the injury is not well described. The classification was described by Ryan and Murray in the rheumatoid arthritis and could be used for this uh, uh, um, sagittal bent injuries. 
So the treatment most of the time is conservative. You need to keep the MCP joint in extension for a minimum of uh, four to six weeks to let the sagittal bend heal. And uh, you can use this kind of splint. Otherwise, sometimes you need to go for a surgery to repair this rupture here to repair and to keep in a splint for four weeks and then you can start a full rehabilitation. So this is for the box of knuckle. What about the box of fracture? The box of fracture is something that we see really common because everybody thinks he's a boxer. And the box of fracture is classical, the fracture of the neck of the fifth metacarpal because uh, the people like uh, to punch. So there is a, a force applied on the head. They will bend the neck of the first metacarpal and we will arrive to see a patient with pain and swelling around the fifth metacarpal. What is really important is to see if there is no rotational deformity. As you know, when you close the finger, all the fingers are going to a central point that is the distal pole of the scaphoid. So in the case of a rotational def uh, deformity, you will see well, a big displacement. You will see that the pinky finger is difficult to strengthen, or it can cross over uh, the uh, four or the rarely the third meta, uh, finger. And you can see here on this gentleman, he presents a fifth metacarpal fracture. And you see when he starts to bend, it's difficult to make them bend completely, but you see that the fourth, uh, the fifth finger is overlapping the fourth finger. So you need to do an X-ray. They will show a fracture. Here it's, for example, a, a non-displaced fracture that doesn't require any surgery. But when the angulation is really important, we need to go for a surgery. If you decide not to pray, you can go for this quite intrinsic position uh, splint. But uh, you can also apply a small gantlet with a syndactyly. Otherwise, there is different technique to stabilize this fracture and to allow the athlete to go back to sports activity quite fast. Another injury that could be rare, but could be seen in the mole of Emirates is the skier thumb. What is the skier thumb? It's an acute rupture of uh, the ulna collateral ligament of the thumb when the skier is falling on his key pole and he has uh, abducted uh, uh, stretch of the thumb that lead to an acute injury of uh, uh, the uh, UCL ligament, UCL ulna collateral ligament. So, you, this ligament is attached from the head of the first metacarpal to the um, proximal phalanx and is recovered by this structure, the adductor pollicis aponeurosis. And you can see here the ulnar collateral ligament. So what you need to know is when you have this adducted thumb injury, you can have until a certain limit uh, displacement of uh, the ligament that will create a stenar lesion when the ligament is completely slipped. And uh, this is even not possible to imagine any uh, conservative treatment because the ligament is impossible to be reattached spontaneously to the proximal phalanx. So it's look like that. You have the adductor polysis aponeurosis and you have the ligament over this aponeurosis. The patient will present with swelling and tenderness to palpation. A round mass could be seen uh, on the uh, ulna side of the metacarpal neck. It's a sign of stenal lesion. And you need to see if there is any instability in full and 30 degrees of flexion, and you need to test the other finger. So if you look here, this gentleman, he has this round mass just at the level here, you can suspect there is a stenar lesion. By the way, you can test it in valgus and you can see that is completely unstable. So it's how we do in 30 degree flexion, the valgus test, they show that the ligament is completely broken. So you have all the um, uh, sign, clinical sign to know that it's a skier thumb. And you need to have more than 40 degrees of laxity than the other side. So the radiography is mandatory to exclude any uh, fracture, but the ultrasound and the MRI is, are really helpful to see if there is any stenal lesion. So in this case, you can see, and it's why it's really important to have good view, you can see here 
This bone flake is the distal attachment of the ulnar collateral ligament. And in this case, you can see here the hood of the aponeurosis, and you can see that the uh, ulnar collateral ligament is completely flipped and it's a stenar lesion. When there is no displacement, partial injuries, and no stenar lesion, conservative treatment with a thumb spin should be applied. But if there is a grade three, so a complete tear with stenar lesion, and even without stenar lesion to high level athlete, I prefer to go for surgery. It's a small chevron incision that we can do on the local anesthesia. You will find here the aponeurosis, the extensor pollicis longus, and you can see here the stenar lesion over the aponeurosis. So the goal is to reattach through small anchors the ligament on the proximal phalanx. And this is the result after the surgery. The patient will wear this uh, um, splint for four weeks and the IP joint of the thumb is totally free. And then it will uh, start the rehabilitation after four weeks and go back to sports activity even after uh, two to three months. So why I decide you to discuss now about the gamekeeper's thumb? Because today the topic was about the injury they have a uh, sports name. So the gamekeepers was maybe one of the first injuries of the hand described in 1955 by uh, a Scottish guy, Campbell, who described these gamekeeper thumbs when they tried to kill the rabbit uh, by breaking uh, the rabbit necks between the thumb and the index. Doing this maneuver don't uh, bring some acute rupture of the uh, ulnar collateral ligament but it brings uh, an attenuation and chronic instability that it uh, should be completely uh, treat, uh, that should uh, treat completely different. So now you know a little bit more about uh, the sports injury in the hand. So when you will hear now about a baseball finger, you know that we discuss about the mallet finger. When we discuss about the jersey finger, you know that it's a close avulsion of the FDP of the finger. The reclimber's injuries is related to pulley's injuries. And when it's box or fracture, you know, we discuss about the fifth metacarpal fracture and the skier thumb about the collateral of the thumb. So thank you for attention. And I propose all of you to follow us on the different social media. And I'm happy now to start the discussion. Thank you, Bernard. It was really uh, great. Uh, it's a fantastic overview of the sport injury in the hand. And uh, I think now we can, you can, if you can start to share your, um, your screen, we can uh, launch the, the, the discussion. Uh, I don't know uh, if we have a lot of questions. People are quite shy, but I have some questions because the, I'm not a hand surgeon, but uh, I've been uh, doing hand surgery when I was a long time ago. And I can see some of them, and we discuss case together. And uh, if we go through the, because you know, uh, in general, and this is, I think it was really great that you present mm -hmm. the different uh, scenario and different uh, type of injuries, because in my uh, in my knowledge, in my experience, I think the, one of the main problem is that they are under diagnosis. So uh, they are, the people are missing the, the diagnosis because it's quite. Uh, difficult sometimes if you don't know uh, that can exist and if you don't have experience so i think the good message for the for the our attendees is to uh, uh, remember that uh, it can happen uh, it's not because the, it's not a golfer or it's not a um, climber that you can have uh, you cannot have this uh, injury but uh, think about all this kind of injury and uh, try to, to have a high, low level of suspicion, I would say, or high level of suspicion, I don't know what we say, but you know, always think about this injury because we see too many, in too many cases, and I know because we share, you share your case with me, we discuss, and it's very interesting regularly, that uh, sometimes people come very late, very late after this kind of injury, and it compromises the, 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 the treatment. So can, can you comment on that, on the chronicity and the, in general so, uh, of this uh, injury? First, I totally agree with you. We always found or search what we know. So mm -hmm. it's why I think uh, this kind of forum are really important because it's to spread uh, the information and the education is really important. 
So yes, the problem, as you say, sometimes uh, I have uh, unfortunately uh, see a lot of patients. They are coming to my clinic with late or misdiagnosis. And it's really a problem because sometimes it's really difficult to treat them and you cannot give them the good treatment they should have since the beginning. We are lucky here in uh, the Emirates because we have a great contact for the sports, uh, you and me. So we are directly in contact with the athlete and they come directly to the professional. But this kind of injury could happen in daily life activities. You can have a mallet finger when you do your bed. You can have a jersey finger if you want to lift your fridge. You can have a climber's finger if you want to lift a heavy things. And even if you want to go to some ski in the monofilm rates, you can have this... Uh, um, uh, uh, UCL injuries. So um, now it's really difficult and there is uh, time to do the surgery and uh, we need to not to wait too much. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, I think it is uh, the, the message, but we will go through the different uh, um, the different injury if you want. We have a question uh, now from our friend uh, Fadi Bori, orthopedic surgeon from... Uh, we will hear you, Fadi. Uh, yeah, from Hamad. Uh, no, no, he's actually, no, Fadi is actually a fellow in Kleinert Institute in the United States. He was one of our fellow at Aspetar, and yes. then he was uh, doing a fellowship now in the United States at the famous Kleinert Institute. Yes, so th this is uh, good to uh, hear from him. Uh, hello, Fadi. I hope you are doing well and your family as well. So the question of Fadi, uh, Bernard, is uh, in case of acute mallet uh, fracture, acute mallet fracture, Okay. Yes. The question of Fadi is what is the threshold to fix the fracture? So uh, actually, uh, when, in other words, for people in attendees, uh, when do you accept to not operate or when do you have to operate and to fix it? Because this is a very frequent uh, question. And the question is, uh, do you, does it depend on the joint involvement? You know, can, you, can you explain us? Yes, exactly. So I told you there is uh, two things. First, first is the 30%. If the fracture is more than 30%, you need to fix it. Why? Because there is an instability in the joint. Uh, I cannot explain you uh, based on the, the picture that I show, but you need to understand that you have on the other side, the FDP joint, the tendon from the jersey. So if you have more than 30% uh, that is gone with the extension tendon, you need to understand that the flexor tendon will tract proximally and volarly the distal phalanx and you will have a, a dislocation of the joint and then it will be a big disaster because the joint will not heal in the good position. So 30% for me is a criteria to do the surgery because there is instability, intrinsic instability in the joint. Second, less than 30%, if it's a displaced fracture, never forget it's an articular fracture. So if there is a displacement of more than one millimeter or two millimeter, you need to go for surgery. If there is no displacement and 30%, less than 30%, I think there is no rule to do a surgery. And um, I hope uh, I reply to your question, Fadi. I hope I'm, 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 uh, I'm looking at that, yes. Uh, I think uh, Fadi is okay. I'm, I'm checking at the same time, you know, on the, on the chat. Uh, there is another question from uh, Tuba Awar. We know that the mallet finger is more common in the ring finger. Uh, is there any specification for the other conditions? So I asked to clarify the question. Um, for the mallet finger? For the, the mallet finger, yeah. Because the jersey finger. I think, yeah, it's, I think there is a confusion so with the, the, the finger. jersey finger. Hmm? So jersey finger, as I told you, two reasons. One, anatomical based on the vascularization, we know that the extremity of the FTP joint is not well vascularized more on the ring finger than the other. And second, I show you, when you do this, the long finger, the middle finger is the longest, but when you close, you see when you try to grab something, you see that my ring finger is almost a half, one centimeter longer than the other. And when you try to grab a jersey, never forget you will be like that, and then the adversary will retract and then the ring finger 
will be the last finger holding the jersey. So it's why it's the most injured for anatomical reason and biomechanical reason. Um, but I have seen a jersey finger for other finger index and uh, um, uh, middle finger, but this happens more when it's in daily life because the people try to lift something really heavy and they try to grab with two finger and then the heavy provoke this forceful extension. Yeah, well, thank you. I think this is exactly the question because Tuba uh, right uh, that it was the, the was, uh, was the, the question about the jersey finger. I have another question for, uh, from uh, Juan David, our friend. Hello, Juan David. Saudi Arabia. Regarding the ulnar collateral ligament, which X-ray projections are recommended? And then when to do the follow-up if there is a small evolution, less than 30%. So, yeah, I see a practical so, question. Uh, I will say for the thumb, AP view, through AP view and through um, um, a through lateral view are mandatory. But I will add in this case, if it's possible to do an oblique view, why? Because uh, I didn't discuss here, but the proper ligament insert on the volar part of the base of the, um, uh, of the, base of the uh, proximal phalanx. And sometimes it's quite tricky to see this correctly, even in a, a true AP view. So uh, an oblique view can give more information. So yes, three view for the thumb. Uh, if the fracture is, there is no place here for the 30%, it's a fracture is not displaced. There is no rule to do surgery because it's a fracture non displaced. Again, I show you uh, the patient with a fracture and a displacement of more than five uh, millimeter. It's not a small bone. It's not the articular surface that we need to treat. We need to treat the reinsertion of the lateral ligament, the ulnar ligament. So uh, you don't need to see the bone like the problem. The ligament is the problem. The ligament is retracted. So I suggest to do surgery. Okay. So not displace. No need yeah. to do surgery. Displace surgery. Yeah. Uh, there is a question for uh, Elfie, our friend from, uh, I think she's in the, uh, Greece, no? Back? Not Switzerland. I think she's in, she's in Switzerland. Switzerland. Okay, but yes. anyway, Elfie was experimented in the physiotherapy. She asked, uh, are there, you know, about the fracture? So the, the I think it's uh, related the to boxer. the boxer fracture. Are there any case reported to, of having fracture on more than one finger? Okay. And in this case, do you operate them at the same time? How do you manage? So, uh, you, you know, I discuss about the boxer fracture because this is the, what so-called eponymous name for this fifth metacarpal. But the classic boxer fracture have a really often multiple fracture or on the neck or dislocation of the carpal metacarpal joint. So it's really common, but they don't have the name. So it's why I didn't present. Yes, if there is multiple fracture, I will operate all of them together. If this fracture are displaced and, and need a surgery. Uh, you can have, for example, a fifth and a fourth metacarpal fracture. If the neck of the fourth metacarpal fracture is not displaced, but you have a volar angulation of more than 60 degrees of the fifth, I will operate the fifth. I will not touch on the fourth. Mm -hmm. But if there is needed, I will do the both at the same time, for sure. I think uh, it answered to your, uh, the question of Elfi and hello Elfi, we're happy that you are here. Um, the question from Faraz. Uh, that uh, I will read the question, you know, <clears throat> the thanks Dr. Bernard for the very uh, eye-opening uh, presentation. Of course, the hand is a very intricate and complex mechanism. We use our hands and fingers in daily activity of, of living. My question, the question of Farrell is, uh, how many of your patients do you send for physio? And how many would you send for onward refer to an occupational therapist for more details and functional specific rehab? Or would you advocate both specialties depending on the, their pathology? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so hand surgeon without physiotherapist and occupational therapist, we are nothing. I can do the best surgery. If I don't have a good hand therapist or an occupational therapist with me, I'm lost. Because uh, we are not only solving organic problems. We need to treat a patient and a hand what is 
for me, one of the most complex uh, limb uh, on the body. So uh, all of this uh, pathology will require some rehabilitation after that because most of them are quite stiff. So there is two things. Is first for the joint, you need to recover the passive range of motion. So this will be done most of the time by the physiotherapist. And it's really hard because they need to work on the scar tissue, uh, the ligament injuries, the soft um, of the joint. And then the occupational therapist is really important, especially when you uh, have some uh, tendon injuries, because sometimes uh, the physiotherapy uh, can reach a good passive range of motion, but the patient needs to integrate this injured end in the brain again. And this is the role of the occupational therapist. They are doing a great job to recover completely the hand function. Okay, thank you. So okay. we start to have more and more questions. One more question from uh, Fadi Bori, which is, I, I understand the, the sense of his question. Fadi asks if you, when a patient comes to uh, your clinic with um, suspicion of UCL, UCL uh, injury, so uh, ulna collateral ligament injury, do you do x-ray before examining and stressing the joint? So in other words, do you take the risk? Can you explain to everyone the, so, the risk? Uh, there is a recent study that showed that you can do the stress, even there is a fracture, except the pain, you will not aggravate the situation. Yeah, can, can you explain to maybe if people who are less comfortable that uh, we, we, the risk is to do so, the stress and to so put the human, you know? It, the people are afraid, and even some people think that when we will do this stress, we can create a stenal lesion. No. You need to create a, really a dislocation of the thumb to create a, uh, a stenal lesion. And yes, if you have any doubt of a fracture and you are scary to make pain to the patient, send him to x-rays first so you know if there is a fracture. But if you do the stress test, you will not displace the fracture too much. There was a recent study one year ago telling that uh, it will not change too much. So, but if you have any doubt of a fracture, it's better to do an x-ray because yeah. the patient will not appreciate the test. <laughs> And another question, interesting, it's from uh, Alexandra Todorovska. After the, you can read everyone because it's, uh, after the injuries in general, after a total recovery, what are the safety points for uh, calisthenics fitness, you know, professionals? Mm -hmm. Because most of their maneuver involve pressure on the palms and using pulling movement. Good question. It depends of the, of the yeah. injury because uh, we know bone are healing, faster than ligament and faster than the tendon. So it's simple. If you have a, a mallet finger, for me, uh, as uh, you apply uh, force on the palm, there is no problem. If you want to grip the jersey finger, you need to wait minimum four to six months before going back to the injury. A fracture, when it's healed, you can go back to all sports activity. If it's a ligament for the thumb, uh, for calisthenic, for me, to, I will tell you, after six, uh, six weeks, two months, you can go back because you don't put any strength on, on uh, the UCL, except if you do some pump with uh, the, uh, the hand like a spider. But if you mm -hmm. do push up with a, a flat hand, there is no problem. So it depends really on the activity and the injured. But always think bone faster than ligament, faster than tendon. Yeah, that's a good message. Uh, we have some other questions which are almost out of the topic, but we can ask them at the end because it's a, the, it's a platform to discuss. But there is a question from Abdara Nasrawi, which is uh, something that I, would, uh, I was planning to ask you. In terms of return to sport, can you summarize for the different um, pathology, uh, what kind of uh, return to sport in time of timing you can uh, advise uh, roughly? Yes, so it's quite easy. The return to sport, if um, um, this athlete is a runner, and he wants to go back to do jogging, he can go back the week after the surgery for me. Mm. There is no problem. Then it's really related to the sports activity. For example, I will tell you a goalkeeper with a mallet finger will not go back to his goal 
before a defender will go back to play with a small sprint in his hand. So it's really depending of uh, the sports injuries. So as I told you, for the mallet finger, you can put a small sprint in most of the sport activity, the PAP joint is uh, moving. So there is this sprint. So for me, he can start to practice sports directly with the sprint. After oh, so surgery, you let the, the sprint because it's a frequent the sprint question. is six to eight weeks. Personally, I prefer eight weeks and for sports activity, three months. But they can start the sport activity with the sprint. If there is any surgery, skin, um, skin healing is the things they will define to return back to play. So if there is um, a jersey finger, the jersey finger is the most tricky thing because the jersey finger most often that uh, they happens to rugby player. So they will not go back before four to six months, depending on the results, because there is a risk uh, to ranger themselves. So uh, for the skier thumb, you can apply a small uh, sprint, as I show you, even a professional skier can go back to ski after today, I would say today of the surgery, if he's ready, because he's protected. But now with the new leaky system, we don't have this small, this uh, same injury with the pole vault. Mm. So uh, it's depending on the sports. Thank you. So it's clear. Uh, I have some questions come because some of the questions are coming uh, not through the chat, but uh, a different way. For example, um, if we talk about the, the, the box of fracture, you know, there is something even for me, we is not uh, and the surgeon, and the, I know that the scene had, had changed, you know, what kind of angulation you can tolerate between, uh, for a fifth uh, meta, which is different from other, to do the surgery or not. So first, you need to exclude any rotational deformity, yeah. because if there is any rotational deformity, even you have 10 degrees of bola angulation, you need to treat the patient. So. Uh, the angulation is only important if there is no rotational deformity. So never forget that on the lateral view of the uh, fifth metacarpal neck, you have a natural, natural uh, angulation of 15 to 20 degrees. So we said if there is a volar angulation more than 40, even 50 degrees, it could be well tolerated by the patient. Honestly, uh, 50 is a lot. For me, 40 degrees, so it means 20 more than natural deformity. 20 degrees, uh, I go for a surgery, uh, like Fouché described, with, with the two pins inside of the fifth metacarpal, because it's a surgery that you can do in 10, 15 minutes on the local anesthesia. It's well tolerated by the patient. But uh, I've seen a lot of patients with 50 degrees that don't tolerate really well, because the problem is, First, the shortening of the fifth, the, the bending of the fifth, and then they are not able to extend completely. Never forget that you can hyperextend the MCP joint of uh, the fifth metacarpal, but if you lose uh, 30, 40 degrees of uh, volar angulation, you will lose this, uh, sorry, if you have 40, 50 degrees of volar angulation, you will lose this, uh, a hyperextension of the MCP joint. So first is case by case. I always explain to the patient, but I know and I know that there is a lot of a study. They said the patient are well tolerated, but it's really common that the patient are not so happy because it's not because they tolerate that even they will accept this on a cosmetic. And there is another question that to follow up the the the, the last question from uh, Wisam is the um, the about the you know the if there is no surgery with a big deformation, the athlete will have deformity of that joint. Uh, what about the strength? So I will ask the question, this question, you know, how many cases of uh, uh, osteotomy for a chronic case with um, malunion you do uh, in which case and what kind of uh, result we can hope? So it's simple. The next I will do it's in two weeks. <laughs> no. And the patient complained since 15 years. And he has pain. Why? Because he has more than 60 degrees of angulation and he has always pain in the palm because when you have this 60 degrees of angulation, don't forget that you have a projection inside of the palm of the head. 
and every time he tried to do bicycle yeah. or he tried to grip something, he has a hyper pressure on the head of the fifth metacarpal. So I discussed with the patient telling him that he's living with uh, this since 15 years. It's quite crazy to come after that to do it, but his complaints are more important and he wants to do it because uh, of the problem. And so it's really, it's not rare to see patient, they, they come to you to discuss about the deformity and how to yeah. fix it. And the solution is a close wedge osteotomy of the first uh, metacarpal. So it's not a small surgery. The yeah, fact is more easy to, uh, to treat. Yeah. We have an interesting question from uh, Dr. K. Jordan, not surprising, clinician. It's a case, uh, I think she correct, she said 50 years old. It's, uh, it's a missed. Uh, ulnar collateral ligament rupture uh, with uh, already CMCG osteoarthritis. So, so you know, the, yeah, it's a, it's oh. a case with, uh, if we uh, understand, the, the sum is unstable, she said, but the patient, you know, was had already, probably already before, a, a complaint of pain due to the osteoarthritis of the joint. Difficult case, I, I guess. How do you manage yeah. that? So, it's simple. Uh, if there is osteoarthritis, is like for the knee, ACL, there is no place to repair any ACL. The joint is destroyed. We don't discuss about instability due to ligament injury. We discuss about osteoarthritis. I will discuss to the patient to tell him that uh, there is no possibility to reconstruct a ligament. He needs to accept or to live with this uh, instability until the pain is daily, or we go for the CMC fusion. So it's an arthrodesis of the joint. But between that, there is no possibility to reconstruct the joint. Thank you for comparing this uh, joint with the noble joint of uh, knee. Uh, one more question. Um, I can say the same for the shoulder. <laughs> um, one more question about the, you know, uh, I would say mallet figure and the jazz finger as well. Yes. What is the place of uh, ultrasound? Because you know, we, you show very well that with your local anesthesia, you can ask the patient to, uh, to move and to, you can co uh, correct. Before the surgery, how you, what is the value of uh, ultrasound to, to, uh, to uh, assess the displacement on a dynamic, dynamic point of view? So uh, the ultrasound is a rule for the jazz finger to see the retraction, to explain to the patient if you are at the grade one, two, or three, three is with the fracture. So one and two essential. Uh, for the mallet finger, ultrasound and MRI are useless. Why? You have an X-ray, so you have a mallet deformity, you have an X-ray that shows no fracture. So it's simple by deduction, it's always a tendon injury. Mm -hmm. So there is no place for the mallet finger for any other exploration. For the Jersey finger, it's, there is a place to see where is the retraction, only to plan your surgery and until when you will open and uh, to give some information about the patient because between a small incision like that and a big incision like this, this is totally different. Um, you can ask the ultrasound or the MRI. There is nothing really special. Yeah, usually we like MRI because there is documentation and we can keep the, 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 the picture, but... Uh... Uh, as we as we have uh, we are close to 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 the end, and uh, there is a question which is not really from uh, Gigi Diano, uh, but we said that we will answer all the questions, uh, and it's a good question, but not exactly in the in the in the topic. But uh, probably this is something that we will not treat by itself. The question is: What are your recommendations for a joint hyperlaxity on the fingers in a young musician? guitar and violin player. We, we see that it's about a case, I'm sure. But uh, so if we can... Uh, I but it, it, it depends. Uh, simple but is always... On, uh, exactly. it, uh, I will take the same uh, comparison with the hyperlaxity of the shoulder. If it's something idiopathic, so it means that it's a hyperlaxity, global hyperlaxity, I think it's better to do nothing. If it's a hyperlaxity of a joint, after an injury, it's simple, we fix the problem. So it could be a, a ligament reattachment or ligament reconstruction. So if there is a hyperlaxity of all the joint, I would not say that I don't recommend uh, uh, 
to musician to do another uh, uh, instrument. No, no. I, I think we need to send him. I need. To, uh, we need to send him to uh, um, occupational therapy and hand therapy to strengthening some muscle in the intrinsic muscle, for example, and to uh, give him some splint to avoid this hyperextension. So we have a lot of things to avoid a surgery, but to do a surgery on, it's always difficult to do surgery to fix hyperlaxity, uh, congenital hyperlaxity. Thank you, Bernard. I think it will be the last question because we said that we don't want to go more than one hour because we want to leave everyone to go back to their family or their activity. So it was uh, really great on my side. I always uh, learn when I listen to your presentation because the, I'm not a hand surgeon, but I love this. Uh, uh, it's a sort of concentration in one hand or all the pathology probably that we can see in other uh, joint, you know, so it's always a, a pleasure to listen. Yes, uh, uh, but especially uh, I need to see to all the audience that we have this interaction together and it's always a nice discussion. But mm. for the people who look on my presentation, you see that all the picture were done by Dr. Landreau. So he's not only uh, mm. crazy and a great surgeon, he's also a beautiful drawer. And you will see in the future a lot of this picture in our keynote. And I thank you, Philip, for all this beautiful picture. And you helped me for that. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. It's a pleasure. And uh, you know that uh, uh, this is one of my, my hobby. And it's a way to uh, use your uh, passion in the, in the field of orthopedics. So thank you, Bernard. It was great. Thank, uh, thank you, everyone, for your attendance uh, and your question. It was like you are not here, but it was so great to see uh, some familiar name coming uh, you know, during this, uh, this uh, presentation and this uh, broadcast and this uh, webinar, as we said. Uh, don't forget to subscribe on our uh, DxBone uh, uh, channel and different social media, you know, Instagram and everything, because we will uh, inform you regularly about this educational uh, uh, event and, uh, and stuff, because we will uh, continue every week for the period of uh, uh, COVID. Uh, next week I will be uh, on the podium, if we can say, if we can, uh, like in a con in congress, I will talk about uh, pathology that probably is underestimated and uh, 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 under diagnosed, diagnosed as well, the meniscus root uh, tears, the knee, and I will uh, explain you how we can uh, suspect, diagnosis them and uh, treat them. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I wish you the best for you and your family. Stay home, stay safe. This is very important. We are uh, working for our patient, but if we can uh, be safe for our family, it's very important. And uh, uh, we wish you the best and see you in uh, one week. Uh, we will be informed uh, of, with the link and the time. It will be the same time. See you in one week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Philippe. See you guys.